chat, I see a number of uh, our students, uh, MBA students, I see a number of colleagues from Gibbs, uh, and also a number of individuals uh, from various parts of South Africa, from different sectors. Uh, let me start by introducing myself. My name is Abdullah Varacha. I'm a member of faculty here at Gibbs. Uh, and uh, we are going to be in conversation with two of my colleagues here at Gibbs today, Professor Nick Benadel. Uh, Nick, it's a pleasure to have you as part of this conversation. Thank you for, for dialing in from, from your place out in Parkhurst. And uh, also Professor Adrian Saville, uh, who also teaches at the school uh, and is also the chief executive of Canon Asset Managers. And the objective of today's session uh, is, I think, threefold. Uh, I think the first is really to make sense of some of the macro elements that are playing out at the moment, both in terms of the global economy, but also in terms of the South African economy. We've seen some shifts, we've seen some changes, uh, and very importantly, in the last 48 hours, we've seen some significant decisions and choices taken uh, by the National Command Council led by the President of South Africa. And so the one is really to make sense of uh, some of what's happening at an economic, at a social economic, at a political level. The second is really an opportunity for us to, in making sense of what's going on, uh, have a conversation, uh, both amongst the three of us, but also with all of you who signed in and logged in, uh, to be able to talk about some of the, the questions in terms of leadership, in terms of what the next uh, two to three weeks might look like, uh, and then perhaps to take that conversation in terms of the more longer term outlook. Uh, and longer term, I mean over the next six months uh, in terms of what we, what we might see playing out. Uh, I'll keep the session as interactive as possible. Uh, I'm going to ask if you could please mute your microphone, and then there's a chat column on the side. If you have any questions, any comments, please feel free to put it into that chat column. I'll manage that, and I'll direct the conversation uh, to one of my participants. And so I spent uh, a bit of time this morning putting together a bit of an architecture for today's session, uh, and I want to start perhaps uh, with Professor Adrian Saville, uh, because I think what we've seen in the last seven to ten days has been a big shift in terms of uh, the economic factors, but also the financial markets. Uh, and I've asked Adrian perhaps to give some of his views in terms of uh, where he sees the outlook from an economic and financial market perspective, and, and very importantly, what's been playing out in the last few days uh, in the global and also the local economy. Adrian, can I hand over to you? Thank you. Um, and uh, it's great to be with you and Nick and to everyone else who's joining us here. Uh, and I, I guess we'll come back later on uh, in the session to talk about the, you know, the broader context and implications, ramifications for uh, politics, society, and more. Uh, in terms of your uh, sort of immediate jump-off point about how uh, the economic and financial implications, I think uh, you know for for some time uh, both. Uh, um, you know, in sort of wider domains and in our uh, commentary on South Africa, we've been talking about a country in crisis. Uh, it, had, uh, it required this event to make that the reality, uh, I suppose, is the specifics of the circumstance, but it doesn't change the fact that we now have, or perhaps it makes it explicit now that we have sort of broad recognition that the country is in crisis. Um, what is uh, somewhat unusual or remarkable about this is that we're not in crisis on our own uh, and that it w was necessary for others to join us to really get us all here. Um, from you know, a financial markets perspective, which is what I'm looking at from, uh, uh, in, uh, from our clients' um, uh, position, uh, the there's a number of places that we can go to, and I won't go to the RAND first, which is uh, the obvious place to go, but rather go to VIX, uh, which is the US volatility indicator. Uh, the VIX has been sitting up at you know, 90, and that might mean nothing to, to many people. Ordinarily, VIX, which measures the volatility or the bumpiness of markets, trades around 20 or 25 points in times of incredible stress, it gets up to 50 or 60 points. And through the course of last week, VIX got up to 90 points. How many times have I seen this uh, in the 25, 30 years that I've been managing money? Never. Um, and we've got 
you know, other sort of anecdotes that we can drop in. So for instance, through the course of the week before and last week, uh, it was either an up 4% day or a down 4% day on the S&P 500. It's very unusual to have one day doing 4% up or down. It's uh, uncommon to have two days back to back. We had six days in a row that the market was either up for or down for. And then just take the events of Friday and Monday and Tuesday of uh, last week and this week. Uh, Friday, the market was down 10%. Uh, and Monday and Tuesday, it was up 10 and up 7. Uh, it's just uh, this type of volatility is, you know, I want to say it's almost unprecedented. Certainly in my career, it is unprecedented. And I would be, well, let's leave the forecasts for another time. Uh, the implications for uh, economies extend well beyond South Africa, and the IMF through the course of last week updated their forecasts, and they were taking China, they started the year suggesting China would do 5% growth, they now are closer to 3%. They started the year saying the US would do 1.5%, uh, 2% growth, the, the IMF has now revised their forecast, and they say they think it would be fortunate if the U.S. did anything better than zero. Uh, Europe is now negative growth for the year. The U.K. is negative growth for the year. So we sit in a circumstance where country by country, economic growth has gone down sharply. And for the world as a whole, we found ourselves in, uh, in recession. Uh, South Africa specifically, well, the rand has blown out. Uh, believe it or not, the rand started January at 14 rand to the dollar. Um, and today, you, you're moving rand into dollar at about 17.50. We've been as high as 17.90 over the weekend. So the rand is uh, approximating not only South Africa's circumstance, but also uh, approximating emerging market circumstance because South Africa is a, as, as a liquid, well-developed financial market, South Africa is being used as an approximator for emerging market risk. Uh, so I would, I would just caution you about putting too much anxiety around the RAND specifically. It doesn't mean you shouldn't be anxious, but just be, you know, be cautious of overreacting to the RAND as a specific factor. Uh, a number of uh, uh, commentators have um, updated their forecasts for, for the country. And before you know, speaking about specific forecasts, uh, perhaps I can just make one or two observations about anecdotal evidence. Uh, over the course of uh, last week and the weekend, I uh, took the opportunity to sort of do a, a, a dipstick by asking a number of uh, CEOs how things were going in their environment. And I mean, the, the, the figures that I'm getting are absolutely dismaying uh, from an economic activity perspective. The figures coming from uh, uh, restaurant owners, uh, coffee, uh, coffee shops, uh, clothing retailers, sit somewhere between minus 50% and minus 80% depending on, you know, who I'm talking to. I thought, you know, the weekend before, oh, well, you know, I'll go and do some sort of investing by walking around and some economics by, uh, by barometer. And I went and I spoke to a couple of retailers in Rosebank, big box retailers, and they were talking about footfall of minus 40%. You know, my sense then was, well, this will pass. Uh, it's uncommon, it's unusual, it will pass, and it hasn't passed, it's got deeper. And, you know, what felt like something that would pass through the system with us as distant observers, when we started talking about COVID um, uh, six and eight weeks ago, has become a very, very real uh, circumstance. What it means for the economy, I'll make two numbers and then I'll keep quiet, Abdullah. For the economy, I think that it is fair to point now to something like minus five to minus seven economic growth. Yeah. 
for 2020 and um, for government budget, a minus 10 deficit. These numbers were unimaginable three weeks ago. So Edwin, let me, let me, let me maybe pause you there. Um, and I mean, those numbers are staggering, uh, you know, given the fact that we were uh, already in a very constrained uh, public deficit environment, a very constrained economic growth environment from a country perspective. Uh, and three weeks ago, it feels very different in terms of where we are. Uh, I think, you know, off that bat, Moody's uh, is going to make an announcement, potentially, I've, I've been told, or, or, or is going to make an announcement on Friday evening in terms of the potential ratings downgrade for South Africa. Uh, do you foresee that that will happen, number one? And mm -hmm. if so, would that deepen the impact and implication in terms of, uh, of some of what you've spoken about? Um, just before I uh, answer that, Abdullah, to, to, to respond to one of the comments questions, um, is the South African market not following the Dow or the S&P? In fact, no, uh, emerging markets actually led the Dow uh, and the S&P, which is quite unusual. Um, uh, but uh, keep in mind that the circumstance was sort of initiated out of an emerging market. Uh, I would say that that's sort of point A and point B is the RAND uh, and South Africa are often used as an approximator for emerging market risk more broadly. So rather than following uh, the US, emerging markets, including South Africa, were actually leading uh, the US. With regard to the ratings agencies, uh, I mean, that, that's not a fair question to ask me um, <laughs> <laughs> at all. <laughs> But the, look, the ratings agencies have been pricing South Africa for a downgrade for some time. Uh, whether you look at credit default swaps, bond market yields, South Africa has been priced as if, not we are going to get downgraded, we have been priced as if we were downgraded. Uh, and it's been that way for some time. If Moody's actually calls us on yes. Friday and says, well, you know, this is it, you know, and now it isn't your doing, it's everyone else's doing, I'd actually argue it's a little bit unfair because the, the, the budget uh, did square up and whether you cynically want to say, well, that was just a budget, they were only saying it, they were never going to do it, we'll now actually never know <laughs> because the world has, or events have leapfrogged past that budget announcement. But the budget and Mbaweni were squaring up with all of the right terminology and intention. Uh, what they needed to do was to turn that talk into walk, but they were certainly saying everything that the ratings agencies needed to hear to give us a stay of execution. Uh, that these events have happened, they're actually out of South Africa's hands. And so if we're going to get the benefit of the doubt, uh, we should be given till November uh, until that ratings call happens. Having said that, I think it's academic. You know, whether they downgrade us or not, it's in the prices and the, uh, the, the, the things that we face are so much bigger than a Moody, Moody's ratings agency or any other ratings agency call. Lovely. Nick, I want to bring you in. Um, you know, I, uh, I spent some time with a colleague yesterday and I quoted this quote by Lenin that's been going around where, where Lenin speaks about the fact that there are decades where nothing happens and there were weeks where, where decades happen. It feels like that for two weeks in a row. Uh, it's overwhelming in terms of the impact from everything, from the financial markets, as, as Adrian alludes to, to the business sector, uh, to the political environment, to the decisions by various heads of states around the world, uh, even decisions made by the president of this country. And there's a quote by John Gilbreth that I love. Uh, John Gilbreth says that all of the great leaders have had this one characteristic in common, it's the willingness to unequivocally confront the major anxiety of their people at their time, and that and not much else is the essence of leadership. I want to take this very sobering picture that was put forward by Adrian and really hand over to you to get some of your perspectives in terms of one, the socioeconomic dynamics, and then two, very importantly, how do you see some elements of leadership playing out, uh, and what do you think leaders should do to navigate a very tough terrain, a terrain of uh, minus four or five percent potential economic growth, massive socioeconomic challenges, and heightened levels of uncertainty uh, that we see ahead of us. All rules are suspended. 
when you go to war. And this, this analogy of going to war has been used. So the frameworks we use in a normal period of time, in a way, don't apply now. And what we've got to do is say, if we are going to war, and I think we can regard the virus as an invading enemy that will restructure just about everything that has to be fought in a warlike mode, how do you start to think uh, from a ground zero point of view as to what's actually happening? Uh, Abdullah, you know, for years I've been studying military warfare because that's where strategy comes from. And what happens in warfare is two military forces collide with their plans and a third thing happens. Now, this is even more complex because everything is moving. Everything is changing. So how different societies and systems respond will depend on, on, on three things, I think. One is the structure of the systems. And by that, I mean the political, administrative, economic, organizational, even sector level systems and how they respond differently. The, the second is the how we structure and organize for, to take this process on. And it does require, in my view, a reorganization of, of politics, of government, of business and civil society because we've got used to operating in a particular world, that world simply don't, no longer really exists. And so we can have to take evidence from the present. And that makes life very difficult because normally the memory is stronger than the vision, but memory now is not that helpful to all of us, individuals, organizations, and government. So the two images I've got in my head is the one is, if you think about a river system, all around the world, whatever rivers you know, and you suddenly pour massive amounts of water down the system, each country will respond differently to that arrival of that flood. And so what the South African story is going to speak to us now. Whether we have the capacity as a state to manage this is an open question, and we should know within a, within a week or so. I've been involved with big business, with the PPGI investment team, we've been working closely with the presidency, there's been good policy and good leadership from the president and the cabinet. But how this manifests itself practically, for example, we're just waiting to hear the essential services list is where the test, where the rubber is going to hit the road. Do we have the state capacity to control behavior? Will people be compliant? Will they be responsible? We certainly don't have the Chinese command and control system. So the one aspect is the systems and the structures. And the third leg is, how will people behave? What's the level of social capital in South Africa for people to help each other and to make sure that we follow the rules without the overt presence of the state? So let me say that as a starting point. The second is that the focus area in my mind has got to be the urban and rural poor. That's really where the, the, the dense population, where social distancing is almost practically impossible, where people can run out of money. If you think of contract workers, casual workers, uh, informal, uh, the informal economy, people without an income, that's where we're going to see the hotspots, not necessarily the pandemic hotspots, but the social hotspots. We know for the moment the pandemic hotspots are in fact uh, in the wealthy areas. So those are my two comments. The South African system will respond its way. Business is, is working closely with government. And I have to say the president set a very, very good leadership style. The test will be three levels down, how do people actually behave and what do they do? Uh, and that we're going to find out fairly quickly, I think, in the next week or so. I think, let me turn a bit to organizations and leadership, as, as you suggested. Let me just share a few thoughts about what leaders need to be doing, what we need to be doing. I've always said that leaders need a map and a mirror. A mirror really is the test of whether you're going to be and want to be in this situation or whether you're becoming overwhelmed, uh, emotionally isolated, very frustrated, very anxious. And your point is this is where leaders step up and they step into the challenge. And we've seen some very good examples of leaders doing that. So the first item is, are you prepared to lead or are you just becoming reactive or non-active? You're withdrawing. Now, from a corporate point of view, of course, how do you run an organization virtually uh, is going to be a big, big challenge. How do you get things to happen? What are your command and control systems? What are your communication systems? One very important thing is to avoid the social media and perhaps some of the public media and make sure in your world, in your map of information, are you getting real intel? Are you getting live information? And put some time in to make sure you're understanding your own life, your personal life, your social life, but also your family and so on, but also your organizational life. 
and leaders are reorganizing how they spend their time. So the second area is the, the need for communication. Direct personal communication from leaders is absolutely critical. And at Gibbs, we've been very fortunate to have Nicola as the dean very present and clearly communicating every day. That's what leaders need to do. Even if they don't know the answers to all the questions, your, your presence, your emotional commitment, your leadership, your conviction leadership becomes absolutely critical. The third area is you must reorganize not only your time, but who's going to do what. And I just want to commend the kind of what if scenario building work that every organization should be doing. You should be looking at a worst case set of questions, what if, and list three or four of them and say, what would we do if? And what the military do is they separate that from the people operating the business, either by process or by picking people. They say, please go and consider what we would do if. And that kind of option work is how the military approach planning. Then they pick what they're going to do and they get on with it until it's clearly not the right thing to do. And we'll know that in a week or so. If supply chains get badly disrupted, if there are social conditions that get particularly challenging, we'll know that in a week or so. So spend a bit of time in your day, in your area of work, asking what if this happens? Both the up road a bit and also the downside. And then lastly, I've touched on it really, the, the fourth area is just your own personal leadership. Be present, be committed to seeing it through. I, I think anyone I talk to suggests that we will get through this. This is a this is a process, it is a dynamic. We don't know how long it's going to take, but it is a very different world than the one uh, we've come from. Last thing I want to say, ops people matter now, more than ever before. It's the link between what moves we're gonna to make to try and rescue or manage the business, and then how you make that happen. And your engineers, your ops, your, your process people, your supply chain people really become fundamental if you're able to keep operating. And of course, some sectors of the economy you can, and in others, you can't. I'll stop there, Abdullah. Thank you, Nick. I think, uh, you know, this, uh, this view that, you know, you have massive shifts and changes in terms of both the global and local environment uh, really lends me to speak about, you know, these two concepts that I often use around uh, adaptability, that you have to shift and change in terms of the choices that you take, the type of decisions, the allocation of resources, uh, the posture of the company towards uh, a rapidly evolving external environment that I think has, has changed fundamentally in the last two weeks. Uh, adjunct to that is this very important question uh, around how do businesses navigate, uh, and Adrian, you've put a question in terms of what the business impact might be, but how do businesses navigate, I think, some of the challenges in terms of the short-term uh, difficulty and pain that especially small and medium-sized businesses have to face, challenges around uh, operational costs and fixed costs. Uh, challenges in terms of uh, short-term liquidity, challenges in terms of adjusting very quickly to a new normal, perhaps a new way of doing things uh, in terms of their, their positioning in the market. Uh, and then uh, uh, overlaying all of that is this very difficult but necessary conversation in terms of how do you uh, manage to create stability, uh, ideally in the quickest way possible when there's so much of, of uncertainty in the external environment. And so there's, a, there's a, a really interesting question that was posed, and I'm going to put it to both of you by, by Tamarin. Uh, and Tamarin speaks about the fact that, uh, that we have a specific reality in South Africa, uh, specific challenges uh, th that we face, and we have faced even before COVID-19, and I think are going to be further accelerated, uh, you know, post this environment as we see a weakening and slowing down of economic growth. And that's very much that what do South Africans who have the ability to be able to have a positive contribution. What could they do? Uh, and the question from Tamarin is, do we look at perhaps increasing uh, spend of disposable income online? Uh, so effectively, the question is, how do ordinary South Africans support the economy? And I want to maybe uh, pose that question to both of you uh, and really bring it into uh, the personal leadership context. In your view, what are some of the ways in which South Africans who have the ability uh, to be able to support the economy, uh, what are some of the, the ways in which they could potentially do that? Uh, let me say three things. One is, I'm sure that most of the people listening are, are going through the same emotional roller coaster that everyone else is. But if we're going to be leaders, I think there are three things we need to do. The one is we need to support other people who have less resources than we do in some practical way. The second thing is, as the game keeps changing, 
Uh, the US Marines use the rule of three. They say in a battle condition where things are moving very quickly, every day, pick three things, not three different things, but ask yourself, what are the three focal points of what I'm going to do today, right now? And the third thing I would say to you is just your personal level of energy, that you don't get pushed back by this thing. We don't know where it's all going to end, but our leadership behavior is going to determine where it ends. So we have agency. It's a bit like Sia Colisi on the day of the World Cup final, coming out of the tunnel into a stadium, not even knowing what sport he's going to play or who, he's, who the team is going to meet on the field. The very high level of uncertainty. There's some things we do know, most of which we don't. So keep your energy up in spite of the uncertainty. And, and that way you will be a resource rather than a liability. Adrian? Uh, you know, Abdullah, uh, first, you know, on, just to go back to your company question, and what, what are companies doing or what are businesses doing? I did post a question if anyone's willing to share either on the forum or with me privately. Uh, it would be great to get you know, as much anecdotal evidence because you know, next point about um, you know, in, uh, uncertainty is uh, I think is exactly you know, on the money. In times of crisis, one of your most valuable ingredients is information. And there is a tremendous amount of, you know, fake news, uh, WhatsApp uh, groups sharing, uh, you know, just garbage, manufactured stuff. I saw re-edits of uh, of uh, Ramaphosa's speech. I mean, it, it, it just absolute garbage. And in times of crisis, you don't want to be feeding disinformation, misinformation. The more solid information we can work with, the better that turns into knowledge. And that knowledge gives us beacons uh, that help guide us through through this environment. Um, and, well, I'm um, just to put down as a footnote, I, I, no doubt many people on, uh, on this group uh, watched Boris Johnson shortly after Ramaphosa. I mean, if you ever want an example of statesmanship, I think Ramaphosa it was just an absolutely extraordinary display uh, uh, of, of leadership and uh, strength and uh, stability. And then you had Boris Johnson saying, don't go out with your friends. Uh, tell them no. Um, <laughs> that's for another place in time. But um, if we can work with knowledge, uh, that's one of the ways in which we can turn our anxiety into sort of a source of Okay, what can I do with this now? And that perhaps starts to talk to, to, to next points. Um, a, a couple of businesses have already sort of led the way in terms of battening down the hatches, and I'm not sure that this uh, you know, will help everyone uh, listening in, because if you haven't got dry powder, you haven't got dry powder. It's too late for us to say, well, you, know, you should have strengthened your balance sheet or sat with surplus cash. But a number of companies have um, suspended their dividends, which have already been you know, suspended their dividends. Wilson Bailey, Prelidor, Motus, the ed ed education business, Advertech, the packaging business, Impact, Master Drilling, they've all suspended their dividends to sit on uh, surplus cash. And I think that's sensible. What you don't want to do is you don't want to use that surplus cash then to shut down all activity. And Tamron asked the point about, you know, well, should I go online and spend? No, what South Africa doesn't need is a fresh raft of consumers. Uh, what we need is to come out of this, I would argue is A, a group of investors, um, B, people who are willing to apply any surplus capital to look after other businesses. Um, and to provide them with support. Uh, some companies are going to be trying to reinvent themselves, think of new models. That's what crisis does. Uh, and if we've acknowledged the crisis, what can we learn from others that we can use as models to help shape ourselves? And you know, what can we then do in terms of action? And next point about you know, three things. Uh, it, not everything. In times of crisis, what should I do? Everything. You, know, you think of Rwanda's problem, what, what needs to be fixed? Absolutely everything. You can't do everything. 
You need to focus on a couple of things that are achievable, that are realistic, and that will change uh, the sentiment and the environment. Um, uh, and uh, just to go back up, if I can, Abdullah, um, for a moment about ways in which confidence could be encouraged or fed in this environment. Back to Nick's point about anxiety, uncertainty. We have some exceptionally strong uh, policy institutions uh, and Treasury and the South African Reserve Bank have both stood up uh, uh, on this. South African Reserve Bank cut interest rates by 1%. I think that that's sort of fiddling at the fringes. I don't really think that that changes the story very much in terms of crisis. But um, uh, the South African Reserve Bank in uh, coming into the market today, m making an announcement that they're stepping in to buy bonds. Uh, yes, South Africa, we have quantitative easing. Um, it's our very own version of it. And we've already seen the bond market go much stronger through this morning with the South African Reserve Bank stepping in. Now, uh, perhaps um, uh, I, I'm, uh, I find this sort of uh, rather surreal, <laughs> but here's a moment for helicopter money. So what if uh, in an I think if, you, if you're sitting on minus five economic growth and there is no threat of inflation anytime soon, we've got strong financial institutions, we know how to disperse money. Um, what about a variant on quantitative easing? It talks to your point, Nick, about this being the most vulnerable parts of South Africa are not the people on this call. It's the people sitting in uh, Google to Kailicha, uh, Tembisa, um, uh, it's the 30% unemployed, it's the economically disengaged. Helicopter money could promise all South Africans a thousand rand a month for the next three months. That means 55 billion rand per month into every check account. The South African Reserve Bank can print it. The massive qualifier that I will put down is that this cannot be a precedent in any shape or form for the printing of money. It is a response to crisis and it is a hard stop. At the end of three months, the money stops. Um, and I think that that could go a very long way in alleviating extraordinary anxiety. I mean, I'm making the numbers up on the spot. Uh, they need some proper modeling, but South Africa is equipped to do this. And uh, I would venture that it is an appropriate response given the circumstance. So, so Adrian, maybe on that, uh, on that point, and I think Greg uh, speaks about the fact that helicopter money is a, is a brilliant idea, uh, and I tend to agree, you know, it alleviates, in his words, the threat of social unrest. I think the, the, the difficulty or the contrast is, uh, and I want to go back to Nick's analogy of the military, uh, is in the last seven days, we've seen various countries around the world, from Germany to the United States of America, uh, to some countries in Asia, bringing out bazookas with uh, lots of bullets in the armor, uh, with a significant armory. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have uh, that many bullets. And so, yes, we've got a few small bullets. We've been able to fire them. The impact has been uh, fairly well received. Uh, but the reality is we don't have the absorptive shock capacity to be able to manage perhaps a more longer term uh, challenging environment that we find ourselves in. Uh, do you see the possibility uh, that government will uh, start to play out in terms of some additional uh, fiscal measures to be able to, to alleviate some of that, and helicopter being one of those, or do you think we don't have much wiggle room, and so in a, in a limited wiggle room environment, there's, there's very little uh, bullets that we could put into the gun, perhaps? Well, if it's a fiscal question, so I'll take the, the I'll jump in ahead of Nick. Um, we don't have fiscal wiggle room. You know, we've got the ratings agencies saying to us, stop spending. <laughs> um, and even if we want to spend, that money isn't available. Uh, we don't have the cash flow. So it needs necessarily to be a, money, uh, a monetary stimulus. Uh, that doesn't mean it can't be fiscal, but in order to, uh, for the money to be spent, it needs to be printed. Um, uh, 55 billion is a material number uh, in terms of money supply, and it could translate into inflation uh, and uh, dangerous inflation 
if it's not managed carefully and fed into the economy carefully. So you don't want to put you know, a, a thousand rand a month into people's accounts at the beginning of the month. Uh, you could spend it, you know, as 250 rand per week. Uh, you could allocate on ID numbers or day of birth or date of birth. But there's different ways in which you can sort of uh, drop this money into the economy carefully so that it doesn't turn into uh, a spending splurge and then critically manage the psychology uh, of recipients. But um, what we don't have is we don't have a uh, fiscal room. We don't have uh, a, a sovereign wealth fund. Um, and now is the time that we could be talking about, well, why didn't we uh, build a sovereign wealth fund? And it's a note for our future selves. Uh, Norway, for instance, has two years of GDP saved up in their sovereign wealth fund. So for Norway, uh, this crisis has a completely different uh, uh, hue and, and, and color. Um, the, and the numbers that we need are big. So, uh, you know, the Twitter sphere tells us that the 2 billion that has been put into the solidarity fund by the two South African families amounts to 36 Rand per South African. That's not gonna change lives. That's not gonna solve the crisis. And it doesn't take away, and it's not a political comment either, it doesn't take away in any shape or form what that contribution is. I'm not making any political comment, but it gives you a sense of how much money we need. We are talking about hundreds of billions that are needed for this to have a meaningful social and economic impact. About Abdullah, can I, GDP. sorry, Abdullah, can I just make a last comment? Cause I'm sure we're gonna run out of time. Is to say, if it's a war footing, Sure. Then ahead, the enemy is the, the flattening the curve. And we should meet again on Monday because we will know then whether the curve is exponential or it's starting to flatten. And that's going to give us two different pathways. If it's starting to flatten, that's a very encouraging signal. If it's going exponential from the 700 plus we have, uh, then we're going to have to rethink exactly how do we go about controlling the situation. A lot of this, if I can end, is to say, it's, a, about, it's an economic and a medical challenge. Uh, we've been talking mainly about the economic challenge. Uh, the medical challenge can become extraordinarily chaotic, difficult, and really lead to a disaster. So how South Africans behave in the next four or five days adopting the lockdown is going to be the telling point. So, so, so Nick, we've still got we, we've still got 15 minutes. We've got an hour for this call uh, or the Zoom Zoom discussion, and and I want to maybe shift from the the financial economic to exactly to your point. Uh, I think what I found interesting is pre January there was lots of criticism leveled against uh, President Cyril Ramaphosa that he's been very slow, he's too engaging, he tries to collaborate with many social actors, uh, he speaks quite extensively about unity. Uh, but I think, uh, you know, a month ago, the president met with journalists uh, and he walked into the room and said, you know, my personality, my style, my posture is not what the market expects me or at least what society expects me to do. My style is very collaborative. And so that's who I am. And I think it's a measure of, of his history, right, from the 80s in the trade union environment to the 90s in terms of uh, being an architect, one of the architects of the Constitution, uh, to his role in business. Uh, really, that's the style that he's adopted. It's interesting that that style has really come back to back and support him to Adrian's point around a very strong, a very measured approach that he took on Wednesday evening and even the Sunday before. I think what's important is uh, that this has resulted in a very different dynamic, perhaps, as to how social actors, political actors have engaged with each other. We've seen this in terms of the, the opposition parties coming into a room and having a very different way in which they engaged with some of the challenges of the day. We've seen this in terms of uh, the, the two days that the president took to be able to engage with many social actors before he, he spoke to the country. Uh, we've seen this in terms of uh, the various choices that were taken in terms of economic factors, uh, the socioeconomic factors, the issue of labor, et cetera. And so it came through with, with much engagement. The question that's come through from, from some of the commentary on the side is that this perhaps might start a different way in which actors play out and engage with each other, where business perhaps plays a much more active contributory role, and we see some of that happening at the moment, that labor perhaps uh, comes into the conversation uh, and has a very different way in which it engages. Uh, I know you do a lot of work in the space, and, and, and often we work together in the space. 
do you foresee that this will, I think, uh, you know, create a very different environment or perhaps a very different canvas in which these actors paint the picture? Uh, or do you think it's just centered around this crisis and, and we might not see that playing out? So it's a very good question, which we don't know the answer to, but let me just say two things. Um, I think the president is a reactive leader. He needs a problem to come to him and then he responds very well. And certainly in the 80s, he displayed a lot of that. He's a, he's a quieter leader. He's a collaborator, as you said. He's a consensus builder. This war has come to him. And I think that's how he's responded. If you look at how the previous president was removed, it was a similar kind of style. The pressure for his removal built up. And finally, the president, the, the current president was able to make a move. So this is his, uh, his good zone. This is his... Uh, Good spot, sweet spot. Uh, whether we will build the social capital at the leadership level now because of the crisis between labor, business, civil society, faith-based institutions, the state, and so on, is the test case. I think we're still a very young society in many ways from an institutional point of view. And so we haven't paid the big prices of not collaborating. And this is going to test that. If we have a bad outcome, this country is really going to struggle. If we manage to get through the crisis, the question that you've posed is a good one. Does that mean to a new style of operating? One of the things that really interests me about South Africa, psychologically and sociologically, is do people really think they need each other? And this is the problem of the fragmentation of South Africa that we've inherited from the apartheid state, whether it's geographically, whether it's income, race, agenda, age, et cetera. Do we really figure out we're, we're paddling the same canoe and our personal outcome uh, depends on the collective action and trust? So where you see in Germany and China, this autocratic state-driven response, people tolerate that. Where you have a more open system like the UK, let's leave Boris out of it for a minute, you get a more collaborative approach on the streets. We haven't yet found what our rhythm is about this. Is it structure or is it social capital? And this test, uh, this very challenging moment is going to answer that question. Of course, our hope should be that out of this crisis, government learns to work much better with social actors, with business and itself much, much more efficiently. That remains to be seen. So, so I want to take that, that input and, uh, and Adrian, I want to come to you, perhaps, uh, you know, in integrating your, no, your view. I want to on um, your point before sure. Nick runs away. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, it's amazing how many people have become instant uh, virologists and immunologists, and uh, <laughs> we're all experts on this um, uh, uh, very, very suddenly. But uh, Nick's point is an important one, a particularly important one in terms of uh, if we don't get our arms around this as a society, the impact of the spread of disease contagion, I don't think we've, you know, I don't think we've really got a real sense of the extent of damage that could happen to this society. Uh, the figures are terrifying. Um, and so I just want to sort of put a pin in, in this point. The ratings agencies were pulling us out or hauling us out for political capital, calling Ramaphosa out that they weren't sure that he had the political capital. And lots of us, myself included, armchair commentators saying, absolutely right, this guy needs to show his mettle. You know, he, needs to, uh, he needs to stamp his authority and call the game. Well, um, that has sort of turned 180 degrees on us as a collective because it is no longer about political capital. It is about social capital. Do we have the collective will and discipline to, to manage this as a society and to see not only that we need each other, next point, uh, if I've understood it correctly, but that we can not only be each other's best uh, allies, we could also be each other's undoing. So, so I think I think what's interesting that uh, you know I found coming out of of the crisis that we're in is that we've seen That's a question. fundamental shift uh, in terms of of moving from from individualism to to collectivism. That uh, no matter your financial position, no matter your power, no matter your influence, the impact of COVID nineteen uh, has really amplified this ability to look at 
uh, the collective uh, and really bringing that out together. I think the second is, and there's a question that's come through, and I want you perhaps to integrate it in the question that I'm going to pose to both of you. Uh, there's a question from Dave Snowden, which is very much around, uh, do we uh, potentially see opportunities for innovation teams uh, or people who bring different novel ideas to work alongside the crisis committee to start to identify, perhaps if the curve turns, where some of the opportunities might play out. And I want to overlay that with, with this question to both of you, and, and perhaps Nick, I'll start off with you, is, is do you see some green shoots? Uh, and I know that you, you're going to tell me that there are many caveats to that, uh, but do you see some green shoots? Uh, perhaps if we can navigate and flatten the curve, uh, we can reduce the, the spread, uh, we can find uh, some opportunity perhaps in terms of you know, 12 to 18 months around a vaccine. Where do you see some of the green shoots uh, and green shoots specifically for, for an economy like ours in South Africa. So let me come back to the rugby analogy. Uh, Sia Colisi has led us out of the tunnel and uh, we're now getting a feel of the, of the field and who we're playing against. That's on a massive green shoot. As Adrian has said so well, you know, we, many people uh, were, were doubtful of, of his leadership and his mettle. I, I've known him since the 80s. I had no doubt about his mettle. The question was about his style, and he, this is his style, and he's a strong, this is his strong suite, as I was saying just now. So the green shoots are that business is absolutely actively collaborating with government. Uh, I'm involved in the public-private growth initiative. We've got uh, 23 sectors, all collaborating as we speak, working through a structure. Boos has responded, led by uh, eight committees, working at how we deal with all of the issues, the whole complexity of them. So I think that's a green shoot, whereas government previously wouldn't really talk to business. Uh, the cabinet has had to deal with the economy far more in its face than before, where it put the economy in second place and transformation perhaps in, in first place. And that is one of the questions is, you know, on the other side of this U curve, because I don't expect a V, I think this is going to be a period. On the other side of this U curve, where do organizations end up? And that's why I'm saying, in terms of our personal time, Put some time aside every day. You don't have to commute anymore. Put some time aside every day to help those who need your personal direct help, whether it's emotional, financial, or resources. Do that. If all of us do that, it'll make a material difference. Secondly, make sure that you're spending time stepping back from the emotions of it and thinking about exactly what you called for. How can we innovate? What lessons are we learning? What team should we set up? And then thirdly, make sure that you're on top of operations. And that's uh, the point about the day-to-day, -day, getting things done, making decisions, if you're able to function. You know, many companies are not going to be able to function. Manufacturing companies, mining, they're not going to be able to function in many, many sectors. But those who can, and are certainly in the digital economy and the, and the services economy, there's huge scope now to rebuild our economy. And in fact, the irony, of course, is every crisis breeds an opportunity. So we've been banging away on the fourth industrial revolution for three years. Well, it's just arrived because we're all working <laughs> in this new mode. And it's many ways uncomfortable. I don't know if I should get dressed for work. I don't know, you know <laughs> how I should organize my day. I don't know what disciplines I should impose. Take those on and get organized and uh, we'll have a new economy, some parts of a new economy on the other side. It may be like Eskom where we feared the black hole that if the entire system collapsed, we wouldn't be able to start it up again. I'm sure South Africans will start this up again. We've got a lot of institutional memory. We've got great institutions. We've got individuals now are gonna step up to the plate, maybe a new generation. I'm optimistic about that, but it may be a long you. Adrian, are you in your shorts uh, based on, uh, on Nick's question? <laughs> Uh, should I stand up? <laughs> no, 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 just uh, save us. <laughs> um, I'm so, certainly in my shorts below my formal shirt. <laughs> um, you know, just a couple of the, uh, some thoughts on the, on the green shoots, uh, Abdullah. Um, the, the, the first is to go back to my earlier point about there, is, there has to be a recognition now that this is not about it's someone else's problem and you know, Ramaphosa must fix it. This is our problem. Uh, it is a collective problem. South Africa uh, is our responsibility. And rewind you know, a couple of months and the 
the, 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 the carte blanche net narrative was pervasive. It was, you know, we're leaving. Uh, now it's like, hang on, you know, where are you going to? Because you can't get an airplane. Um, and I, I think it has brought home the, the recognition and the reality that everywhere has problems, everywhere has challenges. We have our own, and it is our collective responsibility to do something about it. To me, that's one of the green shoots. A second green shoot is that uh, you, you, people stood at different points on the spectrum in talking about where South Africa was, all the way, all the way from the nihilists, there's no problem, you know, it's your perception, uh, through to uh, crisis commentators that we're going to hell in a handbasket. Uh, I think that this has brought us closer together in, in a common perspective. And one of the things that is required for crisis to be resolved is a collective, not nationalistic, but national perspective that we agree that there is a problem together. And I'm reminded here of Chris Harney's assassination, that South Africa, if we ever had a crisis, it was that weekend. And here we are, we're a better country, we're a stronger place, we walked through that crisis. The challenge now is we are in crisis where some of our allies or partners, uh, which might have been sources of uh, fuel in the past are now, you know, battling their own ailments and enemies. But, uh, you know, I would take that as maybe not a green shoot, but certainly a, a galvanizer. Two green shoots. Uh, uh, Eskim has a chance now to use all of its spare capacity uh, to do the maintenance. And uh, another green shoot is South Africans might at long last learn that retail is not the source of salvation. And think of all of the saved uh, fuel bills, uh, weekend shopping, restaurant dining, and I'm not wishing bad things on retailers or restaurateurs or coffee uh, shops here, but here's a chance for us to build savings vaults. And those savings vaults, for those of us who are in the very privileged position of having surplus, can be used to help others and to help our future selves. And that is what I mean by an investment or a savings and investment vault becoming quite a powerful multiplier. So Nick talks about the U. Uh, yeah, we may well be in a U and it might run for longer and flatter uh, than the economists are forecasting. But if we use this crisis right, we can use this to restructure what for a long time has been a poorly structured economy. Lovely. I want to I want to maybe close with the following, and I'm, I'm going to ask uh, ask you to give me three or four things on this uh, very short, very sharp. Um, it's incredible how the three of us, uh, you know, always found it difficult to meet because diaries were always overwhelming. Uh, we had to find spots uh, in some environments. It was tough to be able to navigate diaries. And now on on a Thursday afternoon at two p.m., we're sitting in our home. Some of you in shorts. Uh, <laughs> And, uh, and all of a sudden, we have uh, this uh, environment where we haven't even, by the way, entered the lockdown that will have 21 days uh, in our home environments. What do you personally plan on doing? Uh, three or four things uh, to be able to, to really, really leverage this, uh, I think, blissful time at home, but the opportunity to do that. So what are some of the things that you're going to do uh, over the next 21 days um, that I think perhaps will be important for, for all of us on this call, and, and I'll perhaps end with, with some of my own personal perspectives. Uh, Adrian, shall we start with you? Uh, Abdullah, I think, you know, it's a chance to reset, recalibrate, uh, and to remind ourselves of what matters in life. We are so busy being busy, uh, and here is the forced stop. So it's, uh, it's a chance to be mindful, uh, I think it's a chance to get perspective. And you know, I can't say it is my intention to do that. I think this has already caused that, to be far more mindful uh, and to establish a perspective that we can often run past. Um, uh, yeah, you know, we, we put into close confines with family. Uh, there might be some very busy divorce lawyers after this. Um, but my intention uh, is to use this time to, to bind and connect 
uh, with my family. You know, Tash and I are often, you know, rushing off in different directions. And I don't uh, have the privilege of time or the luxury of time that I want with my children. So this forces us, you know, we can still be busy, but we can be, or we can be active, but we can be doing it together. Um, and uh, hopefully, uh, you know, uh, in the remaining industri industrious, uh, with this mindfulness and perspective, uh, not to uh, lose sight of uh, physical well-being um, and to do stuff, you know, whether it's online or at home in the garden, but, you know, just to remain physically, physically busy. There's, uh, I think, uh, you know, there's lots of stuff circulating, but one of the points, or one of the articles that really struck me was about, you know, getting up, get dressed for work, have a diary, be busy, be active, be, be filled with purpose, and next three points, what are the three things I can do in that day? Abdullah, okay. just uh, for me to close off, thank you so much for organizing this. Um, and we do have in some ways more time, in some ways much less. Uh, I'm reminded of the Second World War. Uh, it was called the Phony War. There was about six or seven months after hostilities had been declared before the war really got underway. And I think we're still in the phony condition here, that by next week, middle of next week, later next week, we're going to have a far better grip on the depth of this problem and the scale of it. So the three things for me is, one, to take be in close contact with firstly the people I care about and know and wherever I can assist. And so I'm connected to various business institutions, giving advice, talking to people uh, to try and assist them and, and learn from them. The second is to make sure I give more than I take. That uh, uh, it's very, very important that as leaders, we invest by giving now, by helping other people, using our, our emotional capital, our financial capital, our resources, to help others who really need it. And finally, just to be disciplined, to make sure that I'm disciplined enough to have a productive day, to have time to, to think about the future, but make sure that I am structure my work so that this new form of work is, uh, is productive for me. Lovely. I want to maybe perhaps uh, uh, close with some some personal perspectives in terms of what I what I plan to do. I think the first, uh, I mean, aligned to both of your points is to be a lot more mindful uh, and to spend some time with uh, with people uh, in my family environment. It's it's interesting. My three and a half year old son said to me today, uh, "Dad, I didn't know you knew so much." And I laughed and I said, uh, "Well, you know, we've had the opportunity to engage and we spent two hours together today, and I think it's that. It's this ability to to spend some time with uh, with family." I think the second one to, to all of us who are on this call is this ability to, uh, and really align to both of what you've said, this ability to say that given uh, the expertise that, uh, that all of us have on this call, how do we take a lot of that capital, whether it be financial or social or relational capital, and really utilize that to be able to see how we can, in our very small ways, uh, contribute to some of the societal challenges. I think the third one was, was very interesting when the president spoke about the Solidarity Fund. It's his ability to say, yes, uh, it's going to be a particularly tough time uh, for small and medium-sized businesses who perhaps don't, perhaps don't have the buffers, the shock absorbers, is to be able to see how do we navigate some of that there. Um, and then fourthly, and perhaps most importantly, uh, I think Gibbs yesterday in our social, uh, social media platforms put out a beautiful African pro proverb that says, uh, no matter how along the night is, the sun will rise again. Uh, and for me, that's really been important in terms of thinking about uh, what I can do uh, in my limited way to be able to think about what can I do to increase my contributory role in society more broadly. And so I've had lots of people, I, I, I've been zoomed out, I said, I said on Twitter yesterday, because I've had lots of people saying to me that we'll never get back to where we were. We'll always go to an online environment. People will work from home. Uh, we'll do meetings and strategy sessions and uh, engagements in online platforms. I beg to differ. I think we're going to perhaps go into a hybrid model, but I find that the last four to five days have given me this incredibly powerful message that there's power in terms of human connection. There's power in terms of uh, engaging with day-to-day, uh, -day, every day, a conversation that I have with, uh, with, uh, with a very close friend of mine, a security guard at Gibbs, where we talk about everything from Kaiser Chiefs to football, 
to, to holidays, et cetera. And I miss those moments. Uh, the fact that I can sit in a class and I see a lot of our students on here and engage in a multi-sensory approach. And I think we will get back to those elements because I think society yearns for this social engagement and, and interaction. So I think I want to close perhaps by thanking both of you for your time, for your contribution, uh, for your valued insights. I want to thank all of you who are part of this call. Yes, uh, there's a number of, uh, of questions posed to me privately, whether we'll, we'll share this recording. Yes, we're going to share this recording. And, and our commitment as a business school is we'll continue to enhance these conversations. We'll continue to have conversations like this here so that we can engage, we can connect, we can collaborate. Uh, and in fact, tomorrow, a colleague of mine, Marius Wurstesen, uh, also has uh, a Gibbs hosted webinar session where he talks about uh, some of the scenarios that might play out. Uh, so, so let's keep connected uh, and we'll do this in a virtual format. Uh, but as I said, I think uh, we'll really go into a hybrid format or oh, that's, that's something that I'd really like to see. So thank you for your time and your contribution and, and look forward to keeping in touch. Thank you very much.